this is Haley McLaughlin with the League of Women Voters of Portland, and you are watching the Video Voters Guide. We, in conjunction with Metro East Community Media, are here to talk with candidates running in the May 2020 primary election. With me today is Ethan Knight, running for District Attorney, Multnomah County. Welcome, Ethan. Thank you. Absolutely. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for this office. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, again, my name is Ethan Knight, and I'm running for Multnomah County District Attorney uh, because I love this community. Uh, I grew up here. Uh, I've spent most of my life here. And for the last 20 plus years, I've been a state and federal prosecutor handling virtually every type of crime uh, that we have in our jurisdiction here. So for roughly eight years, from 1999 to 2007, uh, I handled cases at the Multnomah County District Attorney's Office. Robbery, homicide, environmental crimes, those sorts of things. And then in 2007, I moved to the United States Attorney's Office, where I've handled predominantly terrorism and national security cases, as well as public corruption and some violent crime cases. And during that time, I've also had the opportunity to do a number of different things in both the legal community and the community at large, uh, including serving as the president of the Oregon Law Foundation, which works to get legal services to low-income individuals, and vice president of the Oregon State Bar. But beyond that, and beyond all that experience, I'm running for district attorney uh, because I love the community and I think we could do a better job ensuring that we manage the criminal justice system and make it work for all of our citizens. That means fixing it where it needs to be fixed, and most importantly, in this challenging time that we're in now, it means having steady, experienced leadership running the biggest district attorney's office in the state of Oregon to make sure that we manage these cases and these challenges for all of our citizens. Thank you. What role does the Multnomah County DA have in reducing racial bias and disparities in our criminal justice system? Well, as the chief law enforcement officer in Multnomah County, uh, the elected district attorney has a significant role in reducing uh, racial and ethnic biases that are inherent in our criminal justice system. Now, it's important to acknowledge at the outset that the district attorney can't control many of the different factors we see uh, that are the impetus for racial discrimination in our system that exists not only in the criminal justice system, but we're talking about fair housing, we're talking about employment, so many areas. But the DA can do things to affect how sentences are imposed and be a leader in the community in talking about uh, the ongoing challenge that a racial discrimination plays in the system. And that's precisely what I plan to do. You know, I've done a considerable work in trying to increase diversity in the legal profession. And I think that'll go hand in hand with my vision and my efforts to ensure that we have uh, you know, a concerted effort on the part of my deputies to reduce racial disparities that exist in the criminal justice system. Thank you. Under what circumstances would you consider charging a juvenile offender as an adult? Well, for starters, I support the changes that have been made to ballot measure 11 and removing many juvenile offenders outside of measure 11. I think those are important changes that need to be made. And as someone, again, with over two decades of experience in the system, I know that juvenile offenders, uh, both by disposition, background, and frankly, brain development, are different than many of our adult offenders. Having said that, there are rare circumstances in which a juvenile should or could be charged as an adult. Uh, the circumstances I see that uh, as being appropriate in are predominantly the most serious of our violent crimes. Uh, there are homicide cases where uh, the facts are so egregious uh, that a juvenile may need to be charged as an adult. And I think in doing that, we also need to recognize uh, that a 17-year-old is not the same as a 14-year-old or a 15-year-old. And so to be very careful in a case-by-case -case basis, if we're going to make that decision to charge a juvenile as an adult, to acknowledge those differences in background and age inherent in every case. And I would really draw on my experience in implementing that vision and that understanding of the law. Thank you. Please discuss the issues related to pre pre-trial detention and any recommendations you have for reform, including bail? So pre-trial detention is a significant issue and cash bail is a significant issue. Cash bail is the process of holding someone prior to trial uh, based on whether or not they can post a certain amount of money to be released. 
Now, I support uh, repealing cash bail. Uh, I've worked extensively in the state and federal systems, which have different standards and different criteria for holding folks free trial. And I believe in eliminating uh, cash bail. The important thing is to understand what we need to do to replace it and to have someone who has an understanding of the system to implement those changes. So I would recommend moving away from any system that prioritizes or places an emphasis on financial means to stay in custody prior to trial to a system that emphasizes dangerousness and the suitability of somebody to be in the community. You know, domestic violence is an area that's a perfect example. You know, many domestic violence defendants should not be released prior to trial because of the risk they pose to their vulnerable accusers. Now, should that person be held based on the amount of money they have? No, but we should give our judges the ability to detain people prior to trial based on dangerousness. And that's similar to the federal system and the standard we have in place there. So that's the kind of change I would advocate for is eliminating cash bail, but ensuring that we have some standards to keep dangerous people in custody prior to trial. Thank you. What role does the DA have in addressing the societal problems that contribute to criminal behavior? Well, I mean, the district attorney, unfortunately, only has so much power uh, in really addressing some of our underlying uh, societal or social issues. Now, the district attorney should and could uh, do everything he or she can to reduce some of those impacts. And we're talking about uh, poverty, uh, addiction, acute mental illness, all things that we see in the system. And to that end, I've been a long supporter and someone who's created some of the alternative core programs that address some of those things. And they certainly make a dent in uh, addiction, mental illness, uh, those sorts of social problems uh, that we need to work harder to address. But I'll say that really we should be working toward a system collectively outside of the criminal justice system that reduces and eliminates uh, poverty, addiction, those sorts of things, so we don't see people in the system. You know, my goal, frankly, as a lifelong prosecutor is to go out of business. I mean, the reality is, if we could, the best thing we could do would be to reduce the uh, number of people who are coming into the system by virtue of fixing many of those circumstances uh, that have caused people or put people in a position to commit crimes in the first place. It's naive to think we could reduce all of that, but certainly my goal would be to work with partners outside the system and to use and leverage my experience to get to a place where we do reduce some of those societal harms. Thank you, Ethan. This has been the Video Voter's Guide. Thank you for watching. The primary election is Tuesday, May 19th. Be sure to inform yourself about the candidates and ballot measures and exercise your right to vote.